Oh, maybe sometimes. Because he starts to feel nice and mellow. And the thing is, you know, whether... I'm not even on my first slide yet. I'm sorry, I hope I don't run out of time. But the thing is that harm reduction is basically a very simple... It's a band-aid on, on the situation. It's not going to solve all the problems of the world, but it's going to stop some harms. It's going to stop some harms to the individual, to the family, to the friends, to society at large. It's going to stop some of these harms. We actually know how, for example, we know how to stop HIV amongst injecting drug users. We know how to do it. Now, my question, and I'll come to this later, is why isn't Sweden doing this properly? I've had a couple of conversations this morning, actually, that have shocked me. And the situation is even worse than I thought it was. And, and for me, this is also a shock. Because for me, Sweden, <clears throat> I'm from the generation that if I'd been an American, I'd have had to go and fight in Vietnam. And Sweden is the place that gave a refuge to people who didn't want to fight, quite rightly in my opinion, in Vietnam. Sweden, for me, is a country which is like a paragon of preservation of people's human rights. So it's a real kind of paradox, this to me. But we'll come back to that. Oh, so. Just go back, go to Liverpool now. <coughs> I'm actually not a neat. I am. Actually, I was born in Liverpool. I mean, uh, parents were in Liverpool, but my dad was Irish, and so I'm Irish. And I lived in Ireland for a very short time. Then I lived the, most of the rest of the, of the early years of my life in Liverpool. Liverpool appointed the first chief medical officer of health. So Liverpool actually has a really, really long and deep history of public health innovation. I'm not going to read all... They, they, you can look at these while they're up. I'm not going to go through all this, every slide. I've got far too many slides, but there you go. And then in the mid... <coughs> late 70s, mid 80s, Liverpool was the home of the new public health, which was... It took all the old public health and it added on to that social aspects. Poverty, uh, economic factors, to explain why, why people behaved in certain ways. And it was seen as a way to avoid blaming the victim. Because the victim was actually the people, the person who had the problem, not the victim. They were the victim of all these things. But it wasn't their fault that they found themselves living in poverty. And there were two guys in Liverpool at the time, one called... Je John Ashton, Director of Public Health, another guy called Howard Seymour, who kind of espoused this model, and they wrote the, this seminal book on it called The New Public Health. And they decided that they wanted to adopt this New Public Health, based on the San Francisco model, which was what happened in San Francisco when people started to realise there's this thing called AIDS and HIV, and it's involving the community, creating an organisation to lead, because leadership is important, looking at the risk groups, finding out what, they, what would make them do things that they needed to do, what would make them change aspects of their behaviour. Involve them, involve the groups at risk in the delivery, make partnerships, and use the media. So, what we used to do in Liverpool, for example, is we used to kind of, um, invent stories. <laughs> we used to what we call seed the media. So we kind of let it be known that something was happening and the media would get involved. We'd get them in then and then we could explain to them what was happening. And basically the media, um, very important, very, very, very important. Because you can, I can do all the speeches I like, you can do all the speeches that you like. One front page in one national paper, critical, a criticism or some sensational silly story about drugs can really make a mess of everything you do. So the media is very important. So these were the key factors in what happened in Liverpool. And 
You know, I know the Pharaoh didn't build the pyramids. I know that uh, King William didn't conquer England on his own. Like, there were a lot of other people, all the people who died, and all the people who died building the pyramids. But sometimes, the, the fact that there's certain people there at the same time, at the right time, is very important. And I believe without these three people here, I'm going to use the pointer now, that, John Marks, and Alan Parry, without those people, wouldn't have happened. I'm not going to go into detail about who they were, but they were, they were involved at different levels. This was what it was all about in the UK in the mid-80s. This one was interesting. This, this became, this was supposed to scare people off using heroin. And this became all the teenage girls pin up, please have this in their bedroom, because they just thought he was gorgeous, this guy. And he was supposed to be someone who was totally messed up, he, all these horrible spots and things on heroin. And this was just one of the worst. <laughs> One of the things that, that I learned, I hope I didn't have to learn, don't tell lies to anyone about these things, you know. Because heroin can screw you up, but it's not necessarily does screw you up. It's not absolutely inevitable. There are plenty of people I know use heroin, and you would never know. You would never, ever know. Lawyers, doctors, all sorts of people. So, there's a very famous poem, so famous that I don't even know what it's called, by Yevtushenko. And he's talking about children. And he says, telling lies to children is wrong. Telling children that all is well with the world and God is in his heaven is wrong. And I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. If you tell people lies about these things, they, they won't believe you when you tell them the truth. You lose credibility. A key factor was this publication. The Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs was an organisation that used to look, it was a government organisation of experts. <clears throat> and what they said was a very crucial thing. They said AIDS and the risk of an AIDS epidemic is a far greater threat to society than the use of drugs. Very important, very important. And that gave a kind of license for harm reduction. Excuse me, I just have to get some water. For harm reduction, for people to say, okay, you use drugs, but look, rather than spend our time trying to get you to stop, which we can't do anyway, we're going to show you, look, do this, don't do that, modify that behavior, and then you can use drugs, but you can be safer. You never be safe, 100% safe. So, the people, <clears throat> I was, actually, I, I became the director of this a bit later, but I was working with another organisation which worked with the people here, who basically one day said, look, there is a problem of the possibility of the transmission of HIV through sharing of needles. What are we going to do about it? Someone said, why don't we give them clean needles? And that's what they did. He said, okay, we'll open the toilet, we'll make the toilet a place where people can come and get clean needles. Simple as that. No government decrees, no, no council meetings, just let's do it. And that's a feature of public health. Do it. And then let's see what happens. We think this is going to work, let's see. So this, this became the needle exchange in Liverpool and... It was quite amazing. We all thought that Liverpool had a population of heroin smokers and very few injectors. We soon realised that actually it was the other way around. There was a whole load of heroin injectors, some of whom hadn't been to a service for 25 years, who came in. Some of them with the most horrendous abscesses you have ever seen. Some of them basically with holes in their legs. <laughs> Groins that, I mean, from uh, femoral injections, which were just quite unbelievable. But actually, the, the people, the, the primary healthcare people, were 